a lot, Emmett. Sorry, I just got that this meeting, meeting is being recorded notice. Uh, I want to welcome everybody on behalf of UCLA School of Law's Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Uh, we're excited today to be hosting this, uh, this book talk. Uh, we, I'm, I'm going to introduce the panelists. We're going to have uh, some conversation among the panelists and uh, then uh, as we go, if people want to put questions in the Q&A, you're welcome to do that. And we can take questions, you know, depending on uh, when they come up, we can take them as we go, or we can save some of them from the end for the end. But we're very excited um, to have this, this group in, in front of us today. Um, so I'm going to start just by introducing everyone. Um, so I'm Sean Hecht, the co-executive director of the Emmett Institute. Um, and I, we have with us today, Ricky Revez. Um, who is a professor and former dean at uh, NYU School of Law and also directs NYU's um, Center, uh, sorry, Institute for Policy Integrity. Uh, and uh, he is a leading expert on, among other things, the use of cost benefit analysis in informing uh, regulations. Um, and with, with us, we also have Michael Livermore of the University of Virginia, a professor there, who is also a leading expert on cost benefit analysis and the way it informs regulations. And together, uh, Ricky and Michael wrote the book that is going to be the, uh, the subject of, uh, of this webinar today. And so we're excited to have both of them here to talk about their book and about uh, a host of issues relating uh, to how we can restore rationality in our, in our federal, federal government's decision making. Um, we also have with us um, Arden Roll of the uh, University of Illinois School of Law, or sorry, Illinois College of Law, uh, and Professor Roll uh, works on environmental law, risk regulation, and human behavior, uh, including the intersections between uh, psychology and environmental law. Um, and she's going to have some insights also um, and uh, into the, uh, the book and the work that uh, Ricky and Mike have put together. Um, and we also have with us Shi Ling Xu. Um, and Shi Ling uh, uh, is a, an expert in, uh, in also in law and economics and associated areas relating to environmental law um, at Florida State University College of Law. And, and so uh, uh, he also will be making uh, some comments on, uh, on the, the subject of the book. And I think we'll have a great conversation here today. Um, so with that, I guess we'll just get, get started. Um, so, um, so Ricky and Mike, you you uh, wrote this uh, this book, which I, I really enjoyed reading about uh, the the recent history of environmental regulation, and it follows up on another book that you all wrote. Um, I guess right at the end of the George W. Bush administration, beginning of the Obama administration, when we had a very different political environment. Um, but the books really uh, share a common theme about the way, in your view, that that rationality should in form our, our regulatory pro programs. Um, one of the, the ways that you make this claim is you talk about how regulation operates within guardrails and you use the phrase guardrails uh, to, to refer to, to uh, a set of norms and systems that keeps our regulations uh, steady and keeps them, them doing the work they're supposed to do. And so your, your premise is that this, these guardrails allow the president and political appointees to influence the policy goals of agencies because that's something that they have, are entitled to do and should be doing under our system, but also provide some real limits on that that are crucial. So I want you to, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this guardrail system and why you think it's important um, and how that plays into the way that you think about, uh, uh, about, uh, about regulation. And I'll let, I, I actually hadn't thought about which of you I would have, uh, I'd turn to first. Uh, I don't know if you all have a preference about which of you uh, talks first, but I'd love to hear from both of you about this. Um, sure, uh, well, why don't, I, why don't I get us started maybe with, with, with this one? Um, well, thanks so much. Um, all for um, Sean for for organizing um, and the rest of the folks at the uh, Emmett Institute and, and Arden and Sheeling for, for joining us here. Um, it's always fun to chat with you guys. And of course, this is a long-standing conversation that we've all been having over the course of some some time. So it's uh, it's, it's 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 nice to check in at this particular moment. So so the guardrails concept. And so basically, you know, we live in a you know the the the, the system that we have involves. Um, you know, we live in a democracy, and so the idea that you know 
policymakers are going to be accountable to people, that we're going to have elections, that elections are going to have consequences. This is all kind of really built into our system and our system of administrative law. But on the other hand, there are other important values that are at stake, including legality. We want administrative agencies to follow the law, uh, uh, notions about expertise and impartiality. So there are other values that are important in our, um, in our regulatory and administrative system and not just democratic accountability. So um, over the years um, and at kind of important different stages of the development of the American administrative state, what we've seen is the development of what we refer to as these guardrails, which are as you say, a set of norms, conventions, institutions that help um, <coughs> uh, lay out the scope of political oversight, of appropriate political oversight of administrative agencies, appropriate political influence over uh, agency decision-making, and also channels that influence and constrains that influence so that they're re to, in order to protect important values like legality, expertise, and impartiality. And so just to give a couple examples of those, you know, we have judicial review, right? We have this institution where the decisions of administrative agencies are subject to arbitrary uh, to judicial review generally, review for legality, conformity with their underlying statutes, um, and then broadly arbitrary and capricious review under the Administrative Procedure Act. And so that entire structure can be understood as a way of ensuring that agencies, um, you know, yes, there's some latitude within arbitrary and capricious review, and courts are very clear about that, that there's a lot of policymaking discretion that's vested in administrative agencies entirely appropriately, and that can even be responsive to a change in administration. Um, you know, that, that was language that you can get right out of State Farm, very important case interpreting uh, the standard of arbitrary and capricious review. On the other hand, there are limits, and agencies have to provide reasoned decisions for their uh, uh, reasoned, you know, grounds for their decisions. They have to rely on uh, evidence. They can't just ignore important factors and so on. So that's that's one institution um, and set of substantive standards, the institution of judicial review and the standards that come out of the uh, arbitrary and capricious review and Chevron and the whole, the whole apparatus. Uh, within the executive, um, and so the APA, of course, you know, we get in the mid-1940s and kind of thicker judicial review of administrative decision-making we start to see in the 60s and 70s, especially. And, um, you know, there was another important moment, which was the, the early 1980s, when the institution of the Office of Information of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, was, was both created towards the end of the 1970s and then vested with the power of regulatory oversight in the Reagan administration. And so um, OIRA, has many important roles, uh, one of which is to review the decision of administrative agencies and you know, kind of run them through the White House. Now, in some ways, this actually is a, a mechanism to subject agencies to political control because of course, you, know, you have a political appointee in, in, in charge and you're in the White House. But at the very same time that this institution was created, the substantive standard of cost benefit analysis was put at the heart of this regulatory review process. And so it wasn't just run it by the White House for political oversight, it was conduct this analysis according to these you know, standards. And then that's, that analysis is what we're gonna be reviewing. And so that, um, that substantive framework, that structured review helped again, channel political oversight. It wasn't just whatever we feel like in the White House, you know, we're going to have a conversation about how you count benefits, how you count costs. And importantly, over time, you know, that this process, this, this analytic process has helped inform decision making in ways that depart from what you might expect the normal kind of politics to lead to. So those are a couple of examples of kind of very broadly the, the concept that we're talking about there. And maybe I'll just add a couple of words uh, other than also to join Mike in thanking Sean and the Emmett Institute and Arden and Shiling uh, for putting all of this together and participating uh, in it. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. I mean, one modest way of thinking of the guardrails is the following. Um, if there is no respectable economist or scientist who actually thinks that what the analysis that's being done is, um, is acceptable, then it's probably outside of the guardrails. So it's a pretty modest concept. Um, when we get more specifically into the part of the book that deals with the Trump administration, we can talk about why uh, I'm prepared to say that even on that kind of very modest standard, they drove right past the guardrails, but that might be one way to understand it. You know, professional communities have some range of views on things and 
and within reason, you know, not like the craziest person on the edge, but within reason, um, those, th those differences of views are within the guardrails. And, you know, administrations of each party might pick up, you know, might pay more attention to experts whose views point in the direction that they prefer on political grounds. That's also been part of the system. But there are limits. And part of the thesis of the book is that the Trump administration drove right past those limits. Thanks. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that? So you, I think you used the phrase that the Trump administration crashed against the guardrails and made federal agency decision making irrational based on whim, caprice and political expediency. Um, I think many of us who follow these rulemakings sort of intuitively agree with that. But I think, you know, what, one of the things that, that your analysis does is it, it really unpacks that and, and talks much more specifically about the ways in which that, uh, that played out in federal decision making. Can can you talk a little bit more about what this looked like in practice? Um, and I guess as part of that, compare it to, uh, to past practice, you know, as comparing, for example, what would have happened in previous administrations to the way that the Trump administration uh, changed that and, and crashed through those guardrails. Uh, maybe an example or two would be super Sure, helpful. maybe I'll start on this one. So th this is part two of the book. It's like the middle part. There are six chapters, each dealing with one conceptual flaw. Uh, they're all bad. Uh, and I'll, I'll just pick one example. And, and that's how the Trump administration dealt with co-benefits. That's the indirect benefits of regulation. This issue first came to a head in connection with uh, the Trump administration withdrawal of the finding that um, the regulation of the hazardous air pollutant emissions of power plants was appropriate and necessary. Um, and in, and this is a complicated proceeding, but basically in order to withdraw that finding, the Trump administration essentially ignored massive um, uh, co-benefits. And, and by co-benefits, I mean, they're real benefits. I mean, they weren't like any less real than the direct benefits. It's just that that statutory scheme um, was designed to control the hazardous air pollutants of, um, uh, of power plants. And these co-benefits uh, were coming from um, the particular emissions of power plants and particular emissions under the Clean Air Act. I mean, it's not that they're good stuff. They're just regulated under a different uh, program. They're regulated as criteria pollutants and not as hazardous air pollutants. And therefore these were the co-benefits or indirect benefits as opposed to the direct benefits of that regulation. And so the Trump administration was willing to set aside between 36 and $90 billion of benefits, uh, tens of thousands of premature deaths a year. Now, it never actually even confronted the question that at the same time that it was doing that, it was pushing very hard for considering indirect costs of regulation. That is costs that might not be borne directly by the sources of the regulation, but might have an impact on the broader economy. And so it was basically taking the position that the indirect consequence of regulation must be taken into account if they're negative and must be uh, ignored if they're positive. So start, you know, like think of arbitrary and capricious as standard of the APA. That seems pretty arbitrary and capricious, right? I mean, that basically whether you look at indirect consequences depends on whether they um, uh, promote deregulation. If they promote deregulation, you look at them. If they stand in the way of deregulation, you don't. But it actually, before you like think, well, that's pretty bad, but okay, whatever. It gets way worse. Um, the same month that the Trump administration withdrew uh, the appropriate and necessary finding from American Air Toxic Standards. It also rolled back uh, the clean car standards, um, you know, the, the Obama administration's greenhouse gas emission standards for vehicles. And there it turned out that um, in order to justify doing that, the Trump administration relied almost exclusively on co benefits. Its whole justification for this was there would be safety benefits coming from. Uh, the rollback of these standards. Now, you know, there's a lot of debate in the literature whether these safety benefits were real or not, and whether the models were um, were appropriate. But you know, leave that aside. For these purposes, assume the Trump administration was right, and that there were these real safety benefits. Well, the safety benefits were clearly co-benefits because this was a joint rule by EPA and NHTSA, and from EPA's perspective. EPA doesn't even have jurisdiction to regulate safety uh, attributes of vehicles. I mean, EPA's only um, interest in this area is regulating emissions of vehicles. NHTSA actually does have a safety jurisdiction, but not under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, which was in, 
a, a statute passed during the climate crisis of the 1970s to diminish our reliance on foreign oil it had nothing to do with auto safety. So it may be that auto safety was a perfectly good thing to think about, but it was clearly a co-benefit. So basically in the two, two of the most important proceedings, I mean, these were two of the three most important proceedings of the Obama administration. In the same month, they basically knock down co-benefits to do one deregulatory move and built up co-benefits to do another deregulatory move. They didn't even understand or acknowledge the inconsistencies of what they were doing. So you now think, well, this is actually pretty bad, right? I mean, well, it actually gets worse. In one of these proceedings, they said, well, but one of the reasons we should ignore co-benefits is because um, they can be taken into account um, as direct benefits under some other regulatory provision. And that is true. The particular emissions of power plants could have been taken into account directly by regulating, by strengthening the national ambient quality standards for particular matter. It turned out that the same month, this is all in April of 2020, a very bad month for consistency. That same month, the Trump administration was faced with the question of whether they should strengthen the particular matter emissions, um, uh, they should strengthen national ambient quality standards for particular matter. And there was a strong view in the scientific community they should, they decided not to do that. And in deciding not to do that and even acknowledge the fact that, you know, a couple of weeks earlier, they had said, well, you know, one of the reasons to ignore these things is because it can be taken into account directly when we have a regulatory proceeding that deals with that. Well, they had that regulatory proceeding. They didn't even acknowledge the issue. So this is what I mean by, um, by outside of the guardrails. If you brought some, you know, a panel of economists, I don't even think they have to be that respected, but let's say they have some professional um, uh, qualification and said, you know, is it a good idea to consider the indirect consequent regulations that are negative and ignore them that they're positive? Uh, I, I think they would all say no. And, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, if they said yes, I would think they weren't respectable. So I think, you know, it kind of follows that every respectable economist would be on one side of this. And you can pose other hypotheticals like the ones I did, you know, um, should uh, co-benefits be uh, ignored if they um, stand in the way of deregulation, but taken into account if they promote deregulation? I, I would imagine they would also say no. So this is kind of one of the six examples that part two of the book works out. So, so, so just to kind of get to the, um, to compare this to other administrations, right? Because one, one response to this kind of insanity that Ricky was, uh, was describing is just throw your hands up. And what is the whole purpose of the enterprise? It seems like it's, it's you know, just a shell game. But if we look at other administrations, let's just talk about Republican administrations. So let's keep it within party. You know, we actually see cases where cost benefit analysis informs the decision making, which is the way it's supposed to work, right? And so very famously under the Reagan, under uh, President Reagan, we see, um, you know, there was a question about whether to continue the lead phase out of gasoline, one of the most important environmental, um, you know, uh, moves over the last, you know, several decades. And there was a lot of skepticism in the White House about whether this was a good idea. There was opposition and there was, the agency did a, a, a rigorous worthwhile analysis. And, you know, what could have happened, you know, and under this, the model that Ricky was describing, what would have happened is they would have buried it or they would have forced the agency to do something different to justify the ends that they wanted to accomplish. And instead, <clears throat> they changed course and the, and the president and the senior officials in the White House said, you know what, actually, let's continue with the lead phase out. It seems to have a lot of benefits and few costs. So that actually seems like a good idea. And uh, OI, former OIR administrator John Graham in, has, has documented and, and reported out from his experience during the George um, W. Bush administration, several instances where he, you know, where agencies did solid cost benefit analyses and he was at OIRA and he said, you know, I was able to use these analyses to push back against opposition in the White House um, for rules that were more protective of the environment. Um, he talks about actually auto uh, uh, emissions as one, uh, fuel economy as one, as one area, uh, as well as a couple others. And so that's the contrast here, right? Which of course doesn't mean that, you know, Kumbaya, we were all agreed all the time in the past about everything, but there was just a generally this idea that the analysis was supposed to inform the decision-making rather than just being used as, you know, this completely ridiculous cover, um, you know, with, with no even fig leaf of, of, of kind of consistency and reasonableness to how it's done. If I can just add one sentence on the co-benefits issue. Um, every prior administration, Republican and Democratic, had taken co-benefits into account. This had not been um, um, an, an issue that was done on one side of the aisle and not the other. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you one other question before I turn to our other panelists, which is, I, I think it follows from what we were just discussing. Uh, so back in, certainly in the 80s, in the Reagan administration, when OIRA first took on the role that it has continued to have, and really continually over the, the following decades, conventional wisdom was that using cost-benefit analysis would likely systematically lead to less environmental and public health protection, uh, mostly because it's hard to quantify quantify health and environmental benefits, um, and it's easy to quantify costs, but also for other reasons. I mean, I think it's pretty, it seems pretty clear to me that part of the motivation behind the Reagan administration putting OIRA into its role was a, an emphasis on, on, on pushing towards deregulation. Um, you argue that actually, at least in many cases, the opposite has been true, at least recently, where cost-benefit analysis has actually helped agencies to more effectively address uh, environmental and public health challenges, which really turns that conventional wisdom on its head. Um, and so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about that dynamic, maybe through examples, um, but just generally about you know, why cost benefit analysis has, hasn't been a disaster for the regulatory state in your right. view. I mean, in a way, it was a you know, it's certainly understandable to under, to to why when when the Reagan administration adopts cost benefit analysis and regulatory review, there was some apprehension amongst environmental groups. Reagan was explicitly using these tools, you know, to address what he very very clearly said was over regulation, right? So it wasn't like there was a secret. Uh, it was very explicit. Um, but the reality is, as we argue, that it actually turns out that these tools, when they're done properly, show that there are often very large benefits associated with uh, environmental protection. And this actually isn't all that surprising. Um, if someone, if anyone's taken Econ 101, we know that environmental pollution is like the most straightforward example, or certainly one of the most straightforward examples of market failures, of externalities, of cases where some form of government intervention into the economy is gonna be justified just on the most basic of economic uh, principles. And so, um, so in a way, this is actually, we shouldn't have been surprised by this, although many, many people were. So just to give a couple of examples. So many environmental um, programs, their main benefit is uh, life savings. It's reducing mortality risk and saving human lives. Well, it turns out <laughs> that people value their lives quite highly. And it's just a, a good thing to do. People are willing to pay quite a bit to um, reduce mortality risks. And so, um, and it also turns out that in many instances, it's not that expensive to reduce some of these mortality risks. And, 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 and indeed, if they were traded, if these risks were traded on the, in the economy, we would have reduced these risks long ago. It's only because we externalize these costs and where they're not traded in the regular economy that they, even that they would even persist in the marketplace. And so for reducing particulate matter, Ricky was mentioning particulate matter pollution, has been an enormous boon for public well-being um, on cost-benefit terms, where the, the benefits, the life savings, we're talking about tens of thousands of, of lives that are saved every year, many, many, many millions and billions of dollars uh, over the life cycle of, of these programs. And the costs are um, you know, just a very small fraction of, uh, of the benefits that are generated. Uh, fuel economy is another example where you see very, very substantial benefits um, at relatively small costs. And so, um, you know, so, so those are like really core programs where you can just say, you know, some of the actually the most expensive programs, some of the most um, even more controversial programs, nevertheless, are incredibly well justified. Lead, I mean, for folks in Los Angeles, just the improvement in air quality in Los Angeles has been an enormous boon to well being and reduction in mortality risk. And, um, and you know that's come at relatively small cost compared to the incredible benefits. Thank you. Um, so I do have uh, have some other questions I want to ask, in particular relating to how how you deal with or how we should deal as a society with distributional impacts that really aren't dealt with in cost benefit analysis. But before I do that, I want to give our other panelists a chance to to weigh in. Um, and so I'd love to turn, um, maybe I'll, I'll turn first uh, to you, Arden. 
um, just to, to ask if there were any particular insights that you um, that, that were new or surprising to you in the book or arguments that you that you disagree with in the book what really struck you about the arguments that they're that they're making uh, yeah great uh, thanks thanks John happy to be here uh, and uh, and thanks uh, Mike and Ricky for a, such a such an interesting and provocative book um, so I think what I liked best about the book was just how, nuanced and thoughtful and considerate its consideration of cost-benefit analysis was, particularly in putting uh, the entire institution into political context. Um, and I have to say, the first chapter in particular, it's brilliant. It's a wonderful introduction into the really challenging multivariate considerations um, that, that I go into when cost-benefit analysis makes sense and how it operates as against other kinds of the political and institutional safeguards. Um, and just throughout the book, uh, the, the depth of the examples, the depth of the resources, it, it, was, a, it was a pleasure, it was a joy uh, to read. Um, what, did I, what did I disagree with? I think that the general structure of the book, um, uh, talking about um, the, the, the background tension in cost-benefit analysis um, and in the use of cost-benefit analysis and in balancing expertise uh, versus democratic accountability was super helpful. I agreed with, uh, agreed with that and I found the way that it was framed to be quite helpful. Where I started to, uh, to diverge, at least in how I would have Frame the problem or how I would think about the problems that Mike and Ricky were discussing is probably most in, in two areas. So one is in the question of so what counts as a guardrail and whether what we saw in the Trump presidency is best characterized as having sort of crashed through it or rather just bumped into it. Um, uh, maybe, um, and I'm honestly not sure myself, uh, but, but maybe one way of thinking about what happened in the Trump presidency is that some of the most important guardrails that we have uh, are our, our uh, judicial review and arbitrariness review in particular um, held up against arbitrary action that was embedded in cost benefit analysis. And uh, as the book notes, uh, um, uh, Trump's uh, uh, regulatory actions of the type that they discussed so carefully throughout the book had a terrible win rate in the courts. And so one kind of optimistic view or a, a way of reading what has happened uh, during the Trump presidency is that um, I, I, the, uh, the Trump administration tried to do a bunch of crazy and arbitrary things and they weren't able to succeed at many of them. Um, and so that's a different kind of emphasis. It's not one that questions the underlying um, structure of the book, uh, but it, it comes to maybe a slightly more optimistic conclusion. Um, uh, and then I guess the second area in which I would differ in emphasis has to do with the characterization that the book takes towards these inconsistencies and, uh, and uh, poor choices in cost-benefit analysis in the Trump administration, um, uh, which it characterizes throughout as a charade, um, as a, a sort of purposeful or, or, or with, with overtones of uh, suggesting that it was a sort of purposeful, intentional um, uh, deceit that was being practiced. And there I'm, I'm not convinced that that is the dominant or the, the best explanation for what happened. I think um, another explanation would be that, um, that when people are biased, even sincerely biased, they perceive information uh, differently. And this happens for most people, that it's easier to perceive information in ways that comports with one's uh, pre-existing preferences, uh, pre-existing preferences, for example, for deregulation. And I, it's easier to make mistakes in one direction, the direction that comports with your preference. And so was what we saw the kinds of, of problems, legitimate problems that Mike and Ricky identify um, in the Trump administration's analyses, were those mostly a product of intentional deceit or were they mostly a product of um, a bias, uh, uh, compounding incompetence? I'm, I'm still not convinced of that. And, and I think that that particular difference matters because it matters to what kinds of prescriptions we want to identify if the reason that we're seeing conservatives um, uh, attaching less and less value to cost benefit analysis is that they're all trying to play a shell game or that they are all um, uh, trying to be deceptive. Well, that's one kind of problem and, and a problem of sincerity. 
But if the problem is that, um, that as cost benefit analysis with new methodologies increasingly suggests that many regulations are beneficial, and then that's harder and harder and more and more creates more and more cognitive dissonance for a conservatives uh, to perceive and understand, what we should expect is that conservatives will sincerely continue to um, uh, to like cost benefit analysis less and less. Um, and so that's one example of how whether or not the kinds of uh, phenomena that we're observing are a result of, of sincere bias or charade, it might matter. Um, and so there, I, I wasn't, I wasn't completely convinced um, by, um, uh, by the, um, by the charade story. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn to you, Shi Ling, and basically ask you the same question. If you have, uh, you know, found any particular insights or things that you uh, either diverge or, you know, or, or question from the the, uh, the narrative that the, that the book provides. Yeah, I have. I mean, there are a lot of things I got out of the book. Just on a mundane level, <laughs> it was such an excellent review of all the things that have happened in environmental law cases and regulations challenges that make up the landscape that I'm supposed to know as an environmental law professor. I found it very refreshing to read the first couple of chapters. That, oh yeah, right, right. And you kind of scrupulously filled in the details that I'm supposed to know as well. So now I'm, I'm grateful for that. I guess if um, I'm more cynical than Arden about uh, the motivations. So if Ricky and Mike, you were intending to kind of couch it that way, I think I'm with you. I think that it, it has something to do with my second comment about your intended audience, because I think a shell game is kind of what the Trump administration and its political appointees were engaged in. And I, I, I think like they were willing to do, they were willing to deceive. And I, that's how I interpret the, um, the actions. I fully respect Arden's more gracious, uh, more humanistic interpretation, but but then it, I guess it raises for me the question of what do we do about it? And Arden's right. We have to kind of think about what the prescriptions are based on what the motivations are. And I kind of wondered if these guardrails seem kind of soft. They seem um, uh, like norms and systems might not work if uh, Trump is elected again in 2024, if we get a like-minded candidate or like-minded theatrical politicians in charge. And it makes me think, well, maybe the next part of this book would be stronger, like metal guardrails, um, building back better OIRA so that there is uh, something bigger than circular A4 about what counts as a cost benefit analysis, because I, I don't even think you need a panel of respected economists. I don't think you need a panel of economists. I think the way that Ricky, you posed that question, is this reasonable to think about co benefits this way? I think um, uh, pretty ordinary lay persons would reach the same conclusion that you and Mike did. Uh, so one kind of way to think about this is what might stronger guardrails, better guardrails look like, and it might require some legislation, and it might require some fleshing out of what a good cost-benefit analysis looks like. I was, I, I've always been a fan of this idea, and in reading this book, I learned that this has been um, actually put into place about a best practices, something beyond circular A4, and I've always thought that cost-benefit analysis should have something bigger than circular A4, as useful as it was to say, this, this is when you count co-benefits and maybe this is when you don't. But that might have been a guardrail that would have been harder to crash through. And it's true, you know, uh, they crashed through them and the judicial system put them right, but there's still kind of a time lag in kind of, reversing some of these things. A lot of employees lost. And, and, and think about one irreversibility and one particularly uh, comedic cost-benefit analysis was moving the Economic Research Service of USDA out to Kansas City and the BLM um, to Grand Junction, Colorado. There might have been, I mean, they're fine places to live and there might have been legitimate reasons to do that. 
But uh, I, I mean, I guess I'm of the view is that was that was just political. And the cost benefit analysis that USDA did was not a cost benefit analysis at all. It was 11 pages. And they, I, I, I won't even go into the many, many kind of silly things they did to, to kind of create this uh, illusion that it was saving costs to move people to a cheaper city like Kansas City or Grand Junction. But suffice to say, if we had something more formal as guardrails, maybe some of this would have been avoided. Um, now, just to kind of tie up my comments, I thought about this, and this is such a great book. I, I kind of wondered if you guys were willing to take this on the road and, and kind of make this, it, it was a very accessible book, but it's still not someone that a lot of lay people will read. And I really think that this is a compelling case to be made, especially now. Your, your book is coming out at a time when people don't actually think rationality is such a great thing. And I think making the case for rationality and, I don't know, making more concrete the tens of thousands of people that will die if we don't do this, maybe that's the... Um, that's the next step. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't disagree with anything in the book. I just, it was just too careful, carefully put together. But my divergences might be of emphases uh, uh, instead. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, Mike and Ricky, if you have any quick uh, reactions or responses to that. And then, I, as I said, I have a couple other questions. And then there's also a couple questions in the chat. But if you can start just by uh, uh, any reactions to what we've just heard. Yeah, I mean, I actually agree with essentially everything that Arden and Schilling said, even though <laughs> there was some disagreements with the book. So, um, and, and maybe the differences to the extent there are are semantic and they might be just worth talking about for a minute because um, we understand the things better. I, I agree with Arden that at the end of the day, the overall guardrails work pretty well. Uh, Policy Integrity, the group that Mike and I founded and I now run at the law school keeps, we still have it, a tracker of how Trump administration um, regulatory policies fared in the courts, not only in the environmental area, but across all areas. And they prevail when, the, when their um, uh, regulatory uh, policies were challenged, they prevailed only about 20% of the time. This compares to about a 70% win rate for prior administrations, both Democratic and Republican. This is actually quite atrocious. And, um, and so, you know, and Trump initially said, oh, it's just because these are district judges and when it gets appeal to the courts of appeals, it'll be different. Well, actually it wasn't different. He said these were democratic judges. It turns out they actually did slightly better with Republican appointed judges, but they lost more than two thirds of the cases um, that went before Republican appointed judges. Actually my favorite case, we was, was involved as an amicus party, involved um, these um, penalties, civil penalties for violation of the cafe standards, which the Trump administration had rolled back uh, very, very significantly down to a third. And um, we had been involved in like three phases of this litigation. The last phase of litigation, we find out the Second Circuit panel that this was before. It was not only just, not only three Republican judges, but three Trump appointed judges. Now that's actually pretty unlikely to go, get to a court of appeals panel with three Trump appointed judges. So we thought it was gonna be an unlucky day. It's gonna go really badly. Well, it turned out the three Trump appointed judges voted unanimously to set aside the rollback of the civil penalties. So in some sense, the judiciary as a whole, including um, uh, Republican judges and Trump appointed judges fared better than the executive branch. So I, I, I agree with Arden that if you said the guardrails are on the whole system, then um, for the most part, the guardrails worked. I think in the conception of the book, and I think it's, 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 it's a fair criticism we were more clear, we were thinking of the guardrails around like the institution of cost benefit analysis. And there we thought we would just, they kind of just draw, drove right past them. I think if we were writing it, if this were a draft as opposed to the published book, we would actually clarify this point because I don't think it involves a substantive disagreement at all. Just, um, and on the, and I also agree that people, um, 
who are ideologues perceive information differently being an ideologue also stands in the way of kind of sort of rational um, decision making and, and that was clearly part of what was going on so um, so and this may also be a semantic question the question is you know I think Arden read this as you know did they intend to have a, to make this into a charade and I think maybe we thought of it as, as well the effects were a charade whatever like you know cognitive reasons led them this way when you just put the clear facts on the table it was a charade um, and maybe again if this was a draft um, we should have had this conversation before we published the book we could have actually um, made that uh, clear um, the question of what to do about it that Xi Ling raised is a really good one. I actually, you know, I'm not totally sure of what one does about it. I think this to a large extent is a product of the enormous polarization of the country. And so one solution is to make the country less polarized, but that solution, you know, and how to get there is above my pay grade. I actually don't have, you know, professional training in figuring this out. I uh, have not thought deeply about it, don't have a prescription. The only thing I can think about is that I, I am a believer in cycles. You know, I, I don't think that anything, you know, stays the same way forever. And so there were times when the parties were not as far apart as they are now. There were also times earlier when they were a lot further apart than they became later. So I assume there will come a time when the political parties aren't quite as far, where like, you know, the most conservative Democrat is not significantly more liberal than the most liberal Republican. I mean, this was not true in the 70s and 60s and 80s. Uh, it is true now. And then um, we might be, you know, in a different position with respect to these issues. But I think while American politics is as polarized as it is, um, I worry a little bit about it, and I do see the courts as an important um, bulwark um, and safety net. Um, yeah, just a couple of uh, additional thoughts on this. So, on the um, so on the cognitive dissonance versus intentional deceit piece, it's always I mean, it's always I'm always a little hesitant to attribute intentional deceit to folks. So I, I do try to be charitable in that way. One, I think also additional charitable reading of the Trump administration's use of cost benefit analysis was done by John Graham in a report that he co-authored. Um, I actually, I teach segments of this document in one of my classes and he has this language where he, um, you know, interprets some remarks that President Trump, former President Trump made at a press conference. And let's just say John Graham does a very generous job of taking these remarks and trying them to turn them into something you know, like a coherent, you know, vision of the regulatory state. And what, what he basically says is, look, you know, what President Trump seems to be doing here is placing a, a greater emphasis on values like freedom and liberty um, than on welfare, then, 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 okay, period. And that that departs from the standard that we've used for the last several decades and welfare economists would not agree with it. Um, but it represents an alternative strategy, alternative basis for making these decisions. Now, of course, we could argue about whether that's a good basis or not. You could have lots of different bases, of course, um, but fine, you know, at least it's an alternative. And we actually talk about this a little bit in the book. And we say, look, if you really had some kind of libertarian or, you know, freedom based way of thinking about this stuff, it would have to be much more highly articulated. You have to do real analysis of this stuff, have to take into consideration both the freedom limits of, you know, on the air, on the polluters and on the people that die. So, okay, putting aside all of that, you know, let's just assume for the sake of argument that there's a kind of a unarticulated background ideology slash philosophy that is uh, informing some of these decisions that's not welfareist, where they actually don't think that what they're doing, they don't even think to themselves that what they're doing is improving welfare for the American people. They think they're protecting liberty, right? That's how they would justify it. So then there's two choices. You can either go ahead and say that, and then you produce a cost benefit analysis that has net costs. And they actually did that in some cases. And frankly, I found that to be more admirable. <laughs> it, it wasn't very admirable because they were saying they were gonna cause net harms to the American public. So I don't hold that up in very high regard, but at least it was honest as opposed to, you know, so that's one choice. The other choice is to say, okay, what we wanna do is promote liberty. We know we can't say that we're gonna cause net costs, so let's pretend like the cost that the, the benefits don't exist, or that the, you know that this this and that, or we have a selection of models of reasonable models. Okay, none of these actually get us to the results we want. Let's look for some unreasonable models, right? And so, um, and 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 I think that it you know it's a little bit of a mix, but there was some of both. I think there was some of both of um, genuinely just saying, look, we have reasons for getting to the result that we want that are 
you know, public regarding in a sense, but they're not welfareists, they're not cost benefit reasons. And so we just, we might have to massage the analysis a little bit. Um, final word just on this, on the, on courts and kind of going forward. So I think I'm a more of a court skeptic. I'm really pleased with how the courts held up during the Trump administration. I just don't think that we can rely on that indefinitely, especially if we get more appointees. And if both, if one of the political parties just decides they don't really care that much about cost benefit analysis, um, I think it's gonna be very hard to maintain a judiciary that does. And there was a very peculiar thing that happened during the Trump administration where you, there was basically wings of the party and one wing of the party got to decide who the judiciary, who was gonna go onto the judiciary. And it was very different from the people who were making the regulatory decisions. And so in some ways, it's not even that surprising that the Fed, Federalist Society folks overturned the Trump administration, the Trumpy kind of people, because they're really like completely distinct from each other. But that's probably not going to be the case going forward, right? Like, I don't think we can we can um, bet on the idea that the, the similar dynamics are going to be replicated forever. So, so I really do think ultimately the ultimate guardrail is going to be in elections, and it's going to be in the political parties and political elites coming to some kind of agreement. And uh, who knows if that is what we're going to see. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of synthesize a couple of the points that you made. Just you know, you said one party if one party doesn't care about cost benefit analysis, you know, what can we do? I mean, I think what I would take your comments in on the whole to mean is if one party doesn't doesn't value maximizing welfare as opposed to whatever other values that it you know that that it, it sees as as more important, then there's not much ultimately we can do about it if that's how courts are are inclined ultimately to see these these questions. And I mean. And it is a really interesting question. I mean, so we also, of course, see critiques of the idea of welfare, welfare maximization across society from the left as well. And we've seen some very pointed critiques over the years of cost benefit analysis, um, and they take a few forms. So one of those forms is the idea that you know, in most or many or two, at least enough cases, cost benefit analysis is a charade in the sense that it masks the application of values as objective analysis. Um, even when people are trying their best to quantify things. Um, and another version of that or a different critique is just the, the, that the fundamental task of cost benefit analysis is to maximize overall welfare and not to take into account distributional effects. And so as we see an ascendant environmental justice movement, as we see more people paying attention to the way, you know, in particular, for example, the core uh, programs under the Clean Air Act weren't designed to address, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood environmental justice impacts. They were designed to do something else. And we can argue pretty persuasively that they did that other thing really well, but uh, the question about the distributional impact still persists. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to any or all of these questions about you know, the way in which cost benefit itself embeds values and also to the question of how, how either cost benefit analysis could deal with distributional impacts effectively or what role they ought to have in decision making that ensures that, we, that welfare maximization across society doesn't, take, doesn't result in a few places systematically really being harmed. I think that's a great question. I mean, I'll, I'll get started on this. I'm sure everyone will have something to say about it. Um, so I don't see the welfare maximization and distribution as either or things. I think they're both important. They're important for different reasons. I mean, I think we want to know what the um, aggregate consequences of any government program are. I mean, it's sort of hard to argue that the aggregate consequences um, are irrelevant. I mean, I think we want to know, for example, is this regulation going to save a thousand lives or a hundred thousand lives, you know, we might think differently about it. And I think we want to know, is it going to cost a billion dollars or a trillion dollars? I think we might think differently about that too. I mean, it's, it's just weird to imagine that we would take like really significant actions without wanting to know information of that sort. Um, now, having said that, I think we also want to know um, where, who's bearing the costs and who's getting the benefits. And, um, and, and I think that is one of the failing, I don't think it's necessarily a failing of cost benefit analysis, it's a failing of the system for reviewing regulations that was created, uh, starting with the, these executive orders and the OIRA review. And in some sense, it's not even a failing of the executive orders themselves, at least starting with the Clinton executive order, there's mention of distribution and there's more mention of distribution, the Obama executive order that also adds human dignity and equity and a whole bunch of other like nice sounding things. And Clinton had an environmental justice executive order and there were various, but the, the, 
the sad part about all this is that that stuff has never amounted to anything. And I don't think that's the fault of cost benefit analysis. It's the fault of the fact that whoever was empowered to actually do this work didn't do it. And I think we now have a real opportunity um, to get something accomplished. Uh, on his first day in office, President Biden signed the presidential memorandum on modernizing rectal review that says a lot about the importance of taking distributional concepts into account. And a number of his other executive orders talk a lot about environmental justice. There's an executive order on equity. I mean, this is clearly a priority. And, but the fact that it's a priority doesn't mean it's gonna happen. And I think that this is something that kind of like the community that we kind of belong to um, can actually help with. Part of the problem is that the analytical tools for doing this have not been sufficiently developed. So for example, if an agency wanted to take the stuff seriously, where would it go for guidance? Well, it would go for guidance to Circuit A4, which is the guidance on how to do these analyses. Circuit A4 actually does mention distribution, but it gives almost no guidance on how this stuff should be done. I've been looking at um, the academic literature that looks at sort of distributional consequences of environmental programs. And there is no agreement about the unit of analysis, do you use blocks, do you use zip codes, do you use you know, something else, counties. Um, the claims of disproportionate impact are all different in terms of the groups they look at, what counts as disproportionate and so on. And unless there is an established metric, it's gonna be very difficult to actually compare things and be able to say, well, you know, this is actually worrisome, but that is not. Um, I actually am not, you know, I disagree with part of what Sean said about like the structure of the environmental programs. I actually think, and I'm writing about this, that um, one of the most serious environmental justice problems that we have in our society is results from um, air pollution, not necessarily air pollution from sources that are close to where people live, which is what the environmental justice movement is supposed but just the fact that people live in areas that have very high levels of air pollution, they might come actually from very quite far away because of the way pollution mixes and travels. And you know, the non-attainment provisions of the Clean Air Act, I mean, they've been around for a long time. And the idea was not that this would become like some permanent fixture of the Clean Air Act. Um, the idea was that we would eventually reach attainment and we haven't. And you know, we have not reached attainment with the 2008 PM standards and obviously haven't reached attainment with the 2015 PM standards. And the Biden administration will presumably now strengthen the PM standards, which in terms of it didn't strengthen. And then what's gonna happen then? We will have stronger PM standards and more regions of non-attainment. So one question you might ask is why did, not, did we not put much more emphasis on reaching attainment? And if you look at the case law, it's kind of all over the map. The administration for the most part, you know, administrations of both parties have not taken a um, big, you know, have not made this a big priority. If you look at the case law around LA, non-attainment, basically no one wanted to like, you know, the state didn't want to have a state implementation plan, the federal government didn't want to have a federal implementation plan, no one wanted to do anything. When finally the courts ordered something done, Congress basically um, put an appropriations rider giving them a break. So we've sort of created an enormous complicity around distributional inequities in a statute that wasn't supposed to have them, where, you know, the, the core interest of the Clean Air Act was making sure that every part of the country had uh, air of an acceptable quality as defined by the National Air Quality Standards. And we've, you know, yep. hasn't happened. So, so on the, the question about the, the role of values in cost benefit, I, mean, I think, you know, where di distribution is part of the story, but there's a broader kind of set of questions um, that, you know, that are, that are relevant. The way, so I, so I teach this in my class, you know, I teach a class on regulatory law and policy. We talk a lot about cost benefit analysis, as you might imagine. And, you know, the, the beginning part of that class is I really emphasize this, the distinction between kind of values and facts and, you know, normative reasoning and empirical reasoning, and normative economics and empirical economics. And cost benefit analysis is very clearly within the domain of normative economics, right? It makes prescriptions about what people do, it ought to do, it makes recommendations, right? It makes, uh, it, it evaluates policies. And it's not that, I don't think that the, the appropriate way of thinking about cost benefit analysis is that it um, is in conflict with values decisions or something like that, but it actually, it does explicitly integrate at least some value choices. And the, a, a problem arises when, and some people do do this, and it is, I think, a mistake, and it's something that people ought not do, is describe cost-benefit analysis as a purely objective, purely scientific, purely empirical undertaking. That's just a mistake. That's just like a, 
and anyone thoughtful people should not do that. And I actually thought some thoughtful people do do it and it's a problem. And it's the same way the problem that folks would say, well, we just have to do what the science tells us on climate change. That's not, that doesn't tell, the science doesn't tell us to do anything. Science along with our values provide us with some reasons to do things, right? Um, and I think that this kind of the conflation of empirical questions and values questions is certainly not um, limited to cost benefit analysis. It's all throughout our environmental law, just to take the next example that Ricky was just using, right? We tell the, the EPA to adopt national ambient air quality standards at the level requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. That's treated as though it was a, sci a purely scientific judgment, when in fact, you can't make a decision like that just based on science, right? There's, there needs to be a limiting principle and, uh, and so on. And so um, there's all kinds of cases where we treat you know, public policy and values, values laden decisions as though they were purely scientific. My instinct is to say that in the context of cost benefit analysis is one of the areas where we're probably most explicit about the fact that we're make, weighing and making balancing decisions and doing evaluation. We have a criteria for you for doing that, willingness to pay and you know, there's a whole intellectual apparatus around that. Uh, whereas in these other contexts, like how to set the NACs, we don't even, we're not explicit about it at all and we have no intellectual apparatus about how to make those judgments. And so um, I, I do think it's a problem in the sense that people are not as straightforward about that as they could be. Um, but I think it's actually a little bit less of a problem in, in, in the context of cost benefit analysis than in many other um, uh, kind of regulatory contexts. And can I actually build on that? Is that all right, Sean? Of course, um, yeah. I was just going to so, turn to you and Sheila for more comments. Great. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to say, I think I want to underscore a couple of things um, that, that Mike mentioned, building on Ricky's points um, as well. So one is, I think uh, it's so valuable uh, to, to note that um, distributional questions are hard, whether you're doing cost-benefit analysis or something else. Um, and uh, it, how much should the United States care about its own citizens versus global citizens? That's a very difficult question. Um, and it is a question that is implicated in cost benefit analysis. When, um, when agencies are doing scoping choices, when they're deciding how they're going to value both social cost of carbon and other kinds of uh, mortality risks and other risks as well. But it, it's actually legitimately a hard question on its own before we ever get to any of that um, uh, cost benefit apparatus. And so I think it's just, in, it's particularly important for us not to get confused about what is difficult um, in cost benefit analysis and what is just difficult in general that we maybe see more clearly because of the, the transparency that cost benefit can bring uh, to, to these kinds of, uh, of questions or the way that it can highlight um, these kinds of important distributional questions. Um, that said, I, I also wanna say, um, I, I, and this I think builds more on Ricky's points, um, clearly there have been struggles in the past um, with coming up with a, a way to be systematic about accounting for distributional harms in cost benefit. And indeed there continue to be uh, disagreements about whether that's even something that should be done. Should you have a cost benefit analysis that has distributional weighting or should you not? Uh, reasonable economists, whoever these people are, uh, disagree about that. Um, one thing I would like to see is, is a kind of middle ground um, is basically additional work quantifying vulnerability. So, um, so let me give, if, 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 if you let me hear, um, a, a quick example. And so if there are two people and you have to decide whom you're going to kick, and your choice is either somebody who is wearing full protective gear and uh, shin guards, et cetera, or somebody who is already writhing on the ground holding a broken leg, then most everybody, I think, would first of all try to get out of having to kick anyone, and then if that wasn't possible, would, would kick the person who has the additional resilience, the additional protection. And they would do that possibly for two reasons. One is a kind of fairness point. Don't kick someone when they're down. Why are you abusing this poor person who has already been injured? That's a kind of fairness um, a concern that would lead you towards one person over the other. But the other reason is because if you kick the person who's already injured, you might actually cause more harm with the same action. And the same thing can happen, of course, with levels of pollution, et cetera. And that aspect of, uh, of 
distribution and um, where you have a sort of overlap between distributional harms and the amount of harm that's being caused, I think is a particularly ripe area for cost benefit to be focusing more on um, yeah. in the future. And, and one that so far, uh, be, because of these challenges with dealing with distributional issues, I just haven't seen um, it developed as far as I think it can be in the future. So I'm optimistic with the with the new Biden orders that that's one area that can can end up developing significantly in the coming years. Yeah, and I'll um, you know I I think one of the uh, innovations that we've had here in California uh, to a certain extent is to have more focus on trying to have methods of of mapping and quantifying cumulative impacts and you know using both that vocabulary um, and also using tools. I'll actually put in the chat a blog post, a guest post that someone put up on our blog recently about some of the potential uh, work at the, in the Biden administration that could follow from that. Shiling, I'm, I'm curious if you also have reactions. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Distributional analysis is a bear of a challenge all by itself. I guess I, I might think about technical kind of improvements to cost benefit analysis, such that cost benefit analysis could be finer grained for certain groups. Uh, in the Los Angeles, there are these two papers, I'm not sure they're dueling papers because one came out after the other, but there's a researcher at University of California, Santa Barbara named Kyle Meng, who with um, a researcher kind of found that the, cap and, the California cap and trade system uh, actually reduced um, harm to vulnerable populations. It, there, there's a California definition of freight turn of a, a phrase that I, it escapes me at the moment, but it was about vulnerable communities. And that came after a paper that had that made the exact opposite finding just a few years earlier. But that's the sort of development. And this is, you know, maybe not in our wheelhouse as legal academics, but it would probably behoove us to kind of stay aware of this and try and you know, incorporate some of this kind of analysis so that when you do a cost benefit analysis, you might be able to identify, you might be, be able to do a mini cost benefit analysis for different groups. It's becoming not that hard to tease out the economic effects of regulation. At least economists are making a lot of progress on that. And the reason why that seems like well, plausible to me is that, you know, what Ricky said, if, if, if you're not the first person who said it, I think this is where I've heard it most cogently, is that the air pollution problem in general is something that impacts poorer communities more, um, more than, you know, less poor communities. And not just because of location, it has something to do with resilience, perhaps. And, you know, viewed from that aspect, it, 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 you know, it could be there's a next generation of cost benefit al analysis out there that that could do this by groups. That's, you know, something has been proposed before, but I think what might be different this time around is kind of modeling techniques that are making it more possible to kind of look at impacts group by group by group. And then I don't think you have to get into, you um, a, a trade-off. This is a value, and pretty clearly, ex as expressed in the um, the California law, you know there is a value towards protecting these these populations that are defined as being particularly vulnerable. Um, so that might be a way to kind of deal with distribution and make it transparent and not necessarily kind of go back on cost benefit analysis or question whether it's at tension with other values at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, one, one brief response. Um, you know, I think some of the, my colleague Ann Carlson a couple of years ago wrote a paper on, you know, on micro areas of pollution and the way that the, the Clean Air Act, you know, really 
as much as it is able to address basin-wide pollution problems or not address them since we're still in non-attainment, um, that one of the issues is we don't monitor everywhere, right? And we, uh, we end up with, uh, you know, with, with disproportionate impacts on a sort of a micro level in a way that is very, very hard, I think, to quantify. I mean, I have seen, of course, also deeper critiques, you know, the idea that, um, you know, that the, the mere process of trying to quantify human life and human health is something that, um, you know, that, that, that shouldn't be the frame through which we understand environmental impacts. And, um, you know, and I am, you know, as we talk about this, you know, the, um, you know, I, I really appreciate the comments that Mike is making about, you know, how values are always incorporated into the, the decision making that we do. And I'm, you know, I'm curious what you, you know, what you say in responding to folks who, really, you know, see the whole project for whatever combination of reasons, either because, of, you know, of sort of a fundamental revulsion at the idea of quantifying human life, or at the history of it, and the fact that it was originally devised as a means, um, you know, of promoting deregulation, you know, how, how do you respond to those kinds of critiques in a way that you that that you think is, uh, you know, is constructive and, and responsive? Well, one constructive thing that one you know, should then do is look at alternatives. And I think those arguments really are the product. I mean, you know, initially came up in a different age, like, you know, when I was like in law school, which was, you know, roughly in the middle ages. Um, and, um, and I think we were still living in a, in a threshold world, or we thought we were in a threshold world. We thought that there were levels below which pollution had no adverse consequences. And if you thought you live in that world, it is kind of attractive to try to see if you can like get under the threshold and just have no adverse consequences. I mean, why wouldn't we want that? I mean, maybe we wouldn't want that because it might have like disastrous sort of economic consequences, but maybe not. And if the economic consequences were like reasonable, why not want to live there? I think because the science has improved uh, and our scientific understanding has improved, I think there, there is a kind of, con you know, I think most reasonable scientists um, would think that for most pollutants of interest, um, there are no thresholds. There are adverse impacts at every level. And I think most people also would agree that a kind of, at least in the near future, we can't live in a zero pollution world and we wouldn't probably want to. That is, you know, the, in order to do that, we would have to restructure our economy and our world and such a way and give up so many things that we take for granted that we wouldn't want to do that, which doesn't mean that we don't want to reduce pollution a lot. I think we do want to do that. But so if, if there are no thresholds, it is a continuous function and zero is not the answer. How do we pick the point? And, and how do we do it in a way that doesn't lead to inconsistencies? We're like, you know, in one case, we spend like huge amounts of money to save a very small number of lives. In another case, we, um, you know, are prepared to like give up lots of lives for very little money. Um, you know, when you think of the number of lives that could have been saved if there had been um, mask mandates and, you know, those things are cheap and, um, you know, it, it's mind boggling. It's just mind boggling, you know, like, you know, the very, very low value we put in a, on, a, on a life and, and the inconsistency between doing that and what we do in some other areas. So, um, so I, I think it's, you know, what I would say to get that conversation started is what's the alternative? How do you deal with a non-threshold world? And where on the curve do you stop? And what tells you what to do that? You know, just Thanks. to kind of add, add, some, add some thoughts to that. So, you know, one of the you know, approaches that we've, we've taken at Policy Integrity as well is to say, look, you know, we're not saying that cost-benefit analysis is like the only decision-making procedure that you should ever use to think about anything, right? that there's actually lots of areas where you can arrive at similar answers with lots of different moral frameworks, lots of different decision-making frameworks. So, you know, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is justified, you know, come up with a moral framework that doesn't justify that, I would be surprised, right? So cost benefit analysis certainly does, you know, there's, a, there's a, whatever others you decide that you're using. We actually don't need to fight about like the underlying principles necessarily. We can often come to agreement about ends, even if we don't agree about like the justifications. Kesslinski talks about minimally theorized agreements. And in a pluralistic, diverse society, that's not super surprising. So like on religious grounds, for example, 
decide that we have obligations to future generations. Now, you know, that's going that might mo be very motivating for them and a religious community might come to that conclusion. It's not cost benefit analysis, it's very different from cost benefit analysis, but I might come to the same conclusion on cost benefit grounds and we can actually work together. And that's part of like what makes democracies work in diverse societies. One other just quick thing on this is, is domains, right? So Ricky used the example of thresholds for pollutants. So how, what you would do other than cost benefit analysis or something like it to set uh, an allowable level for a non-threshold contaminant. It's just very hard to imagine. On the other hand, if we're deliberating about freedom of religion and what to do about, you know, when religion conflicts with anti-discrimination norms or something like that, you know, it, it's actually a little hard to imagine how you do that subjected to a formal cost-benefit analysis. It's a lot easier to talk about those kinds of things, reason in, in a narrative way. And so, you know, the point is to, to, to use this tool when it's useful. And, um, and it's, it's in a lot of contexts these days of environmental decision-making, it's, it's really the only game in town or very close to it. Thank you. Um, so I see a bunch of comments in the Q&A there. I think they're all in the vein of comments rather than, than questions. Um, and I know we only have a few more minutes, but uh, uh, Schilling and Arden, if you wanna jump in with some final comments or any responses, you know, especially uh, Schilling, since several of the comments are, are addressed to you, um, love to have just a couple more minutes. And we could stay a minute or two over, but I, I wanna be mindful of everybody's time also. Um, yeah, I would say I um, these comments are, are, are terrific, especially the one that says I agree with Shilling. <laughs> derivative of uh, the the fact that I, I'm 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 kind of um, building off of what has been said by Ricky and Mike and Arden too. So um, yeah, you know I this book was um, this was terrific. It was it was evidence-based and I think that kind of looking past cost-benefit analysis at values like distribution, like freedom, like liberty and you know there's also a brief mention of dignity, human dignity in the book which I think is also another thing that is hard to quantify. Maybe that's the next frontier. For the time being kind of sticking with like what we know is Kind of supportable by science and could hold up in court. I think this this is what it is. But I would say also, you know, to Ricky and Mike, there aren't that many people out there that kind of could go out there and speculate about how it could work better. Um, you know, apart from you too. So um, to the extent you kind of want to uh, move past evidence based and theorizing, proposing changes, I, uh, I think you would find a, a ready audience. And if I can, I'll just make a, a quick uh, closing comment too, um, which is actually a, a pitch to people to read the book. Um, so uh, some books, I think actually you can get most of the value from just listening to someone talk about them for a little while. Um, I, I won't name names or anything here, but, uh, but you know, that's a genre of book. Um, and this book, I, I mean, I hope it's been interesting. I think, I think it, um, uh, you know, the book tees up a number of really fascinating puzzles and we've gotten into some of them um, today, but this is really a book that's, it's like a flaky croissant, right? There's a lot of layers. You wanna get the texture, you wanna experience it yourself rather than just having somebody tell you about the croissant. And so um, I just, I guess my closing comment would just be, there's a lot that we didn't get to. There's a lot of, of detail and layers and, uh, and nuance and flavor uh, to the book itself. And, uh, and it's, it's really worth a read. Yeah, we could easily spend another hour or two or more uh, talking about, about all of this. Um, Ricky um, or Mike, do you have any final comments or responses to, to anything? I saw that last question by Tom McHenry was an interesting one about bringing in non-environmental values. But again, I wanna be mindful of folks' time. So maybe another minute or two to, to, to close. Well, I'm just grateful for the, for the conversation. Thanks so much, um, Arden and Shieling for, for joining and for your, for your thoughts and, and Sean and, and, and for the audience too. This is, you know, like I said, at the top of the hour, this is an ongoing conversation that we, many of us, some of us have been involved with longer than others, but many of us have been involved with for uh, a number of years now. And so I, I look forward to, uh, to continuing the conversation.
Ricky, any any last comments? I just want to add my thanks, Sean, to you and to Arden and Shiling to say how much I enjoyed this conversation. It was really a lot of fun. And it's actually conversations like these that make these kinds of books fun to write. So thank you. Thanks. I've, I really enjoyed the book too. Um, hosting the panel motivated me to, to actually read it, which is rare for me these days to sit down and read a whole book. And I really did appreciate it. Um, I really want to thank all of you for participating. It's been a really interesting conversation. We did record it and we can make the links available and uh, folks can share those links once once we have them. And so um, at least uh, you know other people have a chance to, to hear about it. And uh, I, again, just want to thank all of you. I want to thank our program administrator, Heather Morphew for putting together the Zoom and taking care of all the behind the scenes actions. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a great day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thanks to Ricky and Mike, but thanks Sean.